if muhammad is to be humiliated for his marriage with aisha i would not find that's not the way muhammad has to be criticized i would say that the criticism to what muhammad said would go to one another point which is more important is advocacy of violence a lot of statements that can be presented to justify violence by principle that's all rejected and buried past and people are moving forward and islam needs such a major change it needs a reformation criticize muhammad and his views on other thing especially focusing on the intolerance focusing on violence the war mongering both are the things that would and and stopping of human rights and rejecting the rights of women putting back women into the back doors rajendra prasad first president of india married uh, the girl was only 12 years old so what that was the value system at that time that's changed now nobody should be criticized in history i mean who lived on the basis of the Hello everyone and welcome to the weekend meeting with Sana Lidmaruku. I keep saying weekend meeting every time. <laughs> It just comes out from my mouth. But yes, um I'm Shubhi Sana heading the youth wing of Rationalist International and I would like to welcome everybody who is part of our Zoom and clubhouse as well as our youtube family uh, we have been conducting these conferences for quite a few years now and we are really happy that uh, for each and every one of your support uh, so please note that in this session our zoom clubhouse and youtube would be going on simultaneously so once when we are done with the presentation we would move on to the question answer round where we will take up questions from each of the platform uh everybody who is present in the meeting as always i would request you to uh turn off your videos and audios both while sanal sir is speaking uh it would be easier for recording purposes and once you want to ask a question then you can uh switch it on so now we come to the topic why does islam fail to address criticism Recently a BJP leader uh, Nupur Sharma made a statement in a press conference about Muhammad's life which became a big controversy and many people wanted an apology from India a huge issue was made out of it so even BJP expelled Nupur Sharma to cool down the situation but then another person has retweeted the same thing and was expelled too Qatar Uh, wants india as a nation to apologize to the muslims but it is true what nupur sharma mentioned about muhammad's life uh, it was a fact indeed so it creates a lot of questions like can everyone criticize fate and to what extent is it wrong and so to uh, this is what we want to discuss today uh, at this meeting and for this i would like to welcome sanal sir and request him to make his presentation thank you shubhi thank you everybody welcome to this meeting where we will be discussing one of the most controversial and live issues of these days as you all know the official spokesperson of the ruling party in india made a statement during a debate which many people found insulting islam and when it was retweeted that got a new dimension the hue and cry about criticizing islam and blasphemy and the hot sentiments of religion were all became major topics of discussion but without even discussing what exactly did she say in that meeting if you see the major reports or the discussions on the television the anchors are afraid to mention what exactly was spoken in that controversial debate there at least three or four television discussions about the topic in india 
no one dares to speak what was this controversial and highly uh, blasphemous statement that Nupur Sharma has made. People are speaking in some conceived, hidden way, and nobody wants to speak it out publicly. But it's nothing very serious, actually. It's part of the hadiths. It's part of the Islamic faith structure. It's part of the, the life of Muhammad as narrated by Islam's devout uh, people. A statement in hadiths speak about the marital life of Muhammad. There is no secret about that. Muhammad has married Aisha when she was six years old and she started living with her as man and woman when she was nine years old. This is all what Nupur Sharma spoke. But it's part of the faith written in the text. It's in Bukhari, I mean, it's in Hadiths, it's an official knowledge, and most of the Muslim scholars justify it also. But what's the whole issue then? Well, it's there in our book. It's what we defend in religious meetings. But if you say it, then we hurt our religious sentiments. What is that? It's a kind of an aura of uh, mystery that is kept around the faith of Islam, wherein many people are insisting that others should not speak about it. It could be right, but you have no right to speak about it. It could be right and we would be defending it, but you should not even mention about that. That's the kind of approach that Islam has. In fact, speaking about the life of Muhammad in many directions, Muhammad was a politician. He was a founder of a religion. He claimed himself to be the prophet of uh, God. He said that Allah is the only God and there is no other God and no other God is a God. Well, these all are parts of history that he claims so and he established a religion. He had a uh, I mean, very big army, and he has been defeating his opponents. He has been very brutal to his critics. Well, these all are part of history. Even Quran vouches this all facts. And about the life of Muhammad, there is an authentic document which is approved by most of the Muslim communities in the world, including the Muslim nations. And if you caught something from that text, it's immediately offense to religion. It's immediately blasphemy. It's immediately a cause to raise public question of uh, religious sentiments and hearts religious uh, feelings. What is this problem with uh, Islam? That they cannot tolerate any kind of public discussion or public discourse on their faith, on their prophet, or anything connected with the history of Islam. It goes to what extent we know. Islam believes that Muhammad's picture nobody should draw. Because any kind of image of a human being, or any animal, or anything that is life, is against the wishes of God, as per Islam. That would be amounting to idolatry, idol worship, which Muhammad was against. Therefore, even his own picture cannot be drawn. Well, nobody asks a Muslim to draw his picture. In fact, I would be always curious to see how Muhammad looked like. He was a charismatic person. Well, I don't approve his faith, but I would see as a person who closely watches history, I would certainly understand that Muhammad was a charismatic leader. He could influence a lot of people. He could win a lot of wars. He could win a lot of people. He could establish a religion. Well, I'm curious to see how this gentleman looked like. It's a mistake that Islam has done to history or humankind that a leader of 
their faith is completely anonymous in his shape and nobody can see how he look like well i mean how religious leaders or religious images or religious uh, symbols look like is not that important most of these are artists perception look at jesus christ image i mean what could be the image of a person the the character of uh, the new testament if there was a jesus christ ever lived for example how would he look like he was a palestinian a person who lived in the arabian area and he would look like any other arab any other arab of those times he would be brown in color or dark in color he may have uh, curled hair he may have uh, black eyes but the image that is now known about jesus christ is something very different he would look like an italian with blonde hair long of course like the italian pop singers and he would have blue eyes and he has the skin that would be fitting for a central european italian because those people who painted jesus christ with images in front of them who were the local people and naturally i mean he would look like that but still there is an image that many people would like to see as jesus uh, there is no picture made if ever this character was uh, i mean taken seriously in the first century or second century but we know that in the fourth century the stories of a synod a meeting of the religious scholars initiated by emperor constantine that was in fourth century and the present day bible was finally approved the story of jesus christ was established i think there was no historic evidence for a jesus christ but of course i mean the belief goes like that and there was no image that was presented the images were all coming much later well that's all understandable for a, a mythology when it is transformed to a human being for the faithful people how would ram look like the indian mythological hero i don't think there is any evidence that ram ever existed do i mean or shiva ever existed of course we have a lot of religious texts who speak about these characters that doesn't mean that they existed also there is no evidence that jupiter existed or prometheus existed or or any of these uh, great heroes of uh, the greek faith or the scandinavian faith thor or odin or these are all human imagination so it's the freedom of the people to draw all these imaginary heroes very powerful mythological heroes if you see these stories as mythology it's fantastic and fine stories i would like to see an artist imagination of all these heroes i would like to see how thor look like in an artist imagination or odin look like or jupiter or zeus or ram or shiva or jesus christ or muhammad or even allah in their imagination but for muslims this is all possible you can draw any god or goddess you can draw any kind of natural gods also indra you can call draw you can call draw varuna you can draw vishnu you can draw lakshmi you can draw uh, jesus christ you can draw any other person ahari must you you can draw you can draw, draw zeus but not muhammad because if you draw muhammad that's taken as blasphemy the faithful will never ever make a picture of muhammad but can we do it i don't believe in islam not many of you would be believing in islam can you make an imaginary picture of muhammad and try to present it like like i mean this is a character which we know but that would be taken as blasphemy it was not allowed there were pictures in earlier books of history about muhammad but that has caused a lot of conflict and violence 
many muslims found that if anybody draw any picture of muhammad that is against the wishes of god so the person should be eliminated but for them yes i would appreciate that if they don't want to draw their hero they need to draw but they cannot insist on what others should do it's the freedom of an artist to draw any kind of mythological hero or real hero that's their freedom that is part of free expression which is considered as one of the greatest values of our times if when a person has drawn this picture recently some years back you all know the famous uh, story of uh, charles hebdo the french caricature magazine when they published a series of pictures but not only of muhammad of moses of jesus and also of muhammad none of the other people the jews did not complain about the 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 presentation of moses and the christians did not complain about the presentation of jesus but muslims felt it highly offensive that caricatures of muhammad was made came gunmen with the uh, uh, i mean charge feelings and they go and shoot a lot of people including some of the editors of charles hebdo were killed that has shocked the entire world we all know how the modern world would take such an act it's an act of terrorism for somebody for a for a fine caricature magazine that would make trolls on their presidents on all global leaders all world leaders or any kind of ideas such a wonderful publication charle hebdo of the that it is has provoked some people because their prophet was drawn as a cartoon there and when these people were killed and the trial was beginning and this magazine a set of courageous people they decided that we they were not going to be cowed down by terror and violence and during the time when this trial of these killers were starting they republished courageously all those caricatures which provoked them saying very clearly that no matter whatever kind of violence you inflict upon us we would not cow down and we would not jeopardize our freedom of expression and free thinking in our way of thinking that we want and every artist has the right to express creatively any kind of person from history or mythology they republished it and in the french textbook there is a course there is a session in the french academic uh, session in the schools they have a subject about tolerance about human rights and there is one lesson in that course is on blasphemy laws how blasphemy laws work in different countries they teach in their students and in the textbook they have reproduced this controversial cartoon of muhammad imagine france has the largest muslim population in whole of europe it has the largest muslim population in europe nearly 5% many people say that islam is growing very fast and that's going to be the religion of europe but that's that's very highly exaggerated wishful thinking the highest uh, number of muslims in all of europe is in france and there when this picture was printed in the classroom and it was taught and it was all taken and one student who is a chechenian migrant from a chechenian migrant family found it highly offensive he decided to kill the teacher for that the teacher was beheaded by this person for what for teaching a lesson which was part of the the human rights course there is a lesson about blasphemy laws and this picture which is part of french history some of their fine editors and some of their fine cartoonists were killed because of drawing this picture and that was the lesson about this teacher for no mistake of him was beheaded by 
this student. And you know how the world was shocked about this. Imagine, I have to also mention, when the whole world condemned this act of the original, you know, brutal killing of the, the editors and cartoonists of Charlie Hebdo, all world leaders that we know who stand for freedom and justice and modern worldview condemned that act. There is one world leader, if you call the head of the state of Vatican as a world leader, the pontiff, the pope, was asked by British Broadcasting Corporation, BBC, about uh, this incident. The then Pope said, who is also the present Pope, he said, well, I can understand. I mean, that's not the exact word. He made an example. If somebody punches, somebody criticizes my mother or insults my mother, I would punch his nose. That is the only justification that came defending the terrorist act. That was from the religion of another peaceful religion, the Catholic Church. That was the only religion that defended it. That was the only head of state, though it's a Lilliput state of some few acres only, that was the only state. All other world, the whole world condemned this act. This caricature was now printed in the textbook, as I said, but with the beheading of this teacher, France decided to respond to it. France is an important country for secularism. That's where the idea of secularism was first blossomed and paved way to establish a secular state in Europe. The French Revolution that has transformed the face of the globe, transformed the, the world of ideas, transformed the, the new world that has been shaping up through enlightenment to a new political idea. That was the French Revolution. I would say the father of all revolutions. And with French Revolution, three major ideas were brought into the foundation of this revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity. First time in Europe, one nation emerges as a clear secular state but the clergy was taken out of power. And this country has to defend secularism, no matter whether a large section of Muslims are there, a lot of Algerian Muslims are there, a lot of migrant Muslims are there, and a lot of people, migrants from Turkey are there, a lot of people who are the, from all times who were Muslims there, altogether some 5%. None of them found it very difficult because no, they know what is the French culture. They know what is the French tradition of secularism. They know how they have differentiated laity and authority separately. So the, the French government decided to reassert their position on secularism. They have decided to republish this caricature, which has provoked a terrorist minded boy to show the nation and to show the whole world that we would stand for secularism and we have the right to express an artist presentation. Freedom of expression is one of the greatest values, one of the greatest human rights that we have. The French government decided to show this picture in lights on the Tower of Eiffel, in all French national buildings, this caricature was displayed and shown for several days. That was the answer. If anybody has a problem, they have to understand that it's the right of the artist, it's the right of the nation to say what it wants to do. Nobody stops them believing what they want. They can practice their religion. They can believe whatever they want. They need not draw any picture. But if somebody else draw a picture, they have to tolerate it. They have to understand it. They cannot impose their faith on other people. That's the key of the whole thing. What Islam has been reaching through the hands of some of the extremists. I don't say that the entire Muslims are of that sort. The faith speaks many things. But a small section of a handful 
extremists, a handful of terrorists, want to focus on issues that they consider as the key of their faith, and they want others to follow it. That's the whole problem. They can believe whatever they want. They can believe in a heaven which has 72 hoodies waiting for them. Nobody has any problem. But they cannot blast themselves in a crowd and kill other people to achieve their goal that they consider a reality. They cannot shoot at people. They can practice their faith. They cannot interfere into the lives of other people. That's the key of tolerance. And Islam has a problem at this moment on this issue. That's what we are speaking with a triggering point that we had recently in India. India has a large Muslim population. More Muslims than the country of Pakistan. It's one of the largest Muslim population country. I mean, it's a huge population, 1.4 billion, and more than 20% are Muslims. The Indian subcontinent was divided on the basis of religion in 1947. There was a call for a Muslim homeland when India was getting freedom from Britain. There was big riots. There were huge violence. At the end of the day, Indian subcontinent was divided. The Indian, in British India was divided into two countries, India and Pakistan. India got independence on 15th of August and Pakistan got independence on 14th of August. Before India came into being, Pakistan was established. One day later, all India came into being. So this country, Pakistan, was the creation of a movement which was taken forward by a person who has a secular background, so sad. Muhammad Ali Jinnah was the leader of Indian National Congress. And he was a secular face of Indian National Congress that fought for India's independence. In 1920s, when the uh, Khilafat movement was in the, in the peak of it, right? during the, uh, the World War, I mean, during the World War, Turkey got a big political change. But before that, that was the headquarters of the Ottoman Empire. The World War has demolished the Ottoman Empire, as we all know. The First World War was the end of the Ottoman Empire. And the Caliph of Turkey was the, the, the Sultan of Turkey, was the Caliph of the entire Muslims of the world at that time. That he was considered, that was the center of Islam at that time. So when Britain started fighting against Turkey in the war, and the Ottoman Empire was getting demolished practically, in many parts of the world, there was a moment calling to defend the Caliphate. That was known as the Khilafat movement. It got this biggest support in India because there was a non-Muslim leader who came in support of this move. M.K. Gandhi, whom we later called Mahatma Gandhi. He was the leader, the de facto absolute leader of the Indian National Congress. He said, we would support the Khilafat movement. That was a political move. There was a growing Muslim nationalism, a separate nationalism on the other side, which was promoted by the British Aids. And he wanted to politically address it by bringing a Muslim issue, it's a communal strategy, to take them into the fold of the International Congress. When Gandhi proposed that the Congress should take forward the Khilafat movement, many people opposed within the Congress party. Not only the, the Hindu groups in, in uh, Congress party, but also the secularists. There was a Hindu national group in Indian National Congress. It has a tradition of a lot of Hindu leaders uh, within the Congress party. That includes Madan Mohan Malavia, who was the head of the Hindu Mahasabha. Also Balagangatra Tilak was a staunch leader of the 
Hindu ideology. So these people were at one stage and Gandhi now takes a position in support of the Khilafat movement with, a, with an eye on bringing the Indian National Congress a broader frame with the Muslim nationalists joining in it. That was his strategy. But the strategy caused big damage later to Indian history, but also at that time of history, I mean, he lost many of his supporters. One of the persons who opposed the Khilafat movement was Annie Besant. Annie Besant was a president of Indian National Congress, a British free thinker who later came to India and supported Indian freedom struggle. And he, she was even the president of Indian National Congress and who later started the Theosophical movement. Annie Besant opposed Gandhi's move. But Gandhi had enormous support. He was supported by the entire Congress folk. Annie Besant was sidelined, sidelined, and Gandhi got the mandate. Another major leader who opposed the Khilafat movement was Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who was a secular leader of Indian National Congress at that time. And he insisted that Congress should not take a religious program into its fold. It could damage the entire movement, which was transforming into a secular movement from its pulling from one side the, by the Hindu nationalists and pulling from the other side by the Islamic nationalists. He was on the side of the secular stream of Congress, which also was supported by any person at another side. So many people opposed this move and Gandhi prevailed. And uh, in one Congress of uh, International Congress, Muhammad Ali Jinnah tried to make a public appeal to the members that they should not, they would not go for the Khilafat movement. He was howled by people. He was visited out by the participants because they were all supporting Gandhi. Jinnah was disheartened. He came down and he, he left International Congress and moved to Britain to continue his profession of, uh, as, a, as a barrister. And he lived in London and continued as a barrister for a long time. But during this time, he realized the real politic that was forming in India. Some people tried to convince him to leave the Muslim home rule movement. First, he refused. There were some students who went from Lahore to meet him and proposed that he would come, come to India and lead the Muslim nationalist movement. First, he refused and he said that would not work. But eventually, he comes back to India finally and changes his previous position. And he led a movement that finally created Pakistan. The, the Pakistan resolution was passed by the Indian Union Muslim League and they started these negotiations and British aid is actively supported it. And that provoked violence within India. A lot of people fleeing from the then Lahore and other parts of uh, the, the areas which are in Pakistan now. A lot of Muslims from this part of India were fleeing to Pakistan and there was communal violence. And one of the biggest tragedies of the last century of human annihilation, of mutual killing or violence happened. Millions of people were displaced and several hundred thousands of people were killed in the communal riots that happened in 1947-48. In a way, a wrong decision taken during the First World War, the Khilafat moment, has been one of the streams that led to the division of India. We have to discuss, we have to dissect history at, I mean, at uh, this stage of time, because it's important to understand history to avoid mistakes in the future. Let's come to the whole uh, situation at this moment. Can one criticize Islam? There has been one person in India, again during Indian independence struggle, perhaps the first person who wrote against the faith of Islam. There were a lot of people who were criticizing the faith of Christianity. In Europe, especially in UK, the, the British liberal movement has been very active. 1901, 
1900, I think, 1900, the Rationalist Press Association was established and uh, the series of books started coming out from London under the CD, under the title, the Thinkers Library, which produced a lot of books, scientific books, critic of religion and free thinking was flourishing in Britain. That has spread all around in Britain and it has reached so the, the whole of the English speaking world. From France, there was another movement against Comte and other people. And this was a big change that was happening in 20th century. As a result, the ideas of freedom, the ideas of liberty, the ideas of freedom from religion has been growing in all major parts of the world after a long, long gap. We know such movements existing very actively in Greece. We know such movements existing very actively in India, the Charvagas, the Kannadas, the Kapilas, the Samkhyas. But those all were suppressed. A new awakening, triggered by French Revolution and triggered by the new thought that was coming, triggered by the Rationalist Press Association, triggered by the Thinkers Library, a new revolution has started. This revolution transforms the entire Europe. But in India, we have been fighting for our freedom divided on religious planks and using religious techniques and using religion to win people's support. Indian nationalism has been so pressed by Hindu nationalism and Muslim nationalism at two sides and the secular stream was comparatively so pressed. It got new currency, it got new strength, but the new Pakistan, when it was formed in the one of the first speeches in the parliament of Pakistan, the first speech of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, maybe his secular background, I mean, somehow ignited in him. He made a speech. The content of it is uh, as follows. He said, we have been asking for a Muslim homeland, but now we have to realize this would, this would not be anymore a Muslim land. This would be a land which would welcome Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs and all other people. And all people live with peaceful mind here. And our basis shall be the identity of Pakistan, not the identity of Islam. Well, that was the father of the nation of Pakistan, but nobody listened to him. They have been in an euphoria after the creation of an Islamic Republic. There have been tendencies towards that direction, uh, I mean, what, what one could see more and more happening. And Jinnah died a few years, but the history of Pakistan has shown very clearly that it has been very clearly going to the Islamic line. But a fanatic version of Islam has been developing in many parts of Pakistan. There are many groups in Pakistan that have been trying to influence the government to make it more radical than it is now. And it's an Islamic Republic. And in Pakistan, if you criticize Quran, if you do not respect Quran, if you criticize Muhammad, you could get death punishment. It's in their penal law. There is a similar law in India, Article 295A. The same source for both the countries. I mean, the Indian penal code was written in 1860 during the British regime. And that's the basis for Pakistan's penal code and India's penal code. In Pakistan, this close code calls for death penalty, whereas in India, it's a, I mean, some years of prison and punishment. So it, uh, in Pakistan, if you criticize Islam or Quran or Muhammad, you get death penalty. I don't know whether uh, in recent times anybody was uh, executed for that, but there were many people who were condemned to death for uh, insulting Quran or criticizing Muhammad. I know personally one very famous case of Muhammad Yunus. Muhammad Yunus was a teacher in a university. And in the, during the class, I think he was in a medical college, he was teaching there. And during the class, he somebody asked a question about Muhammad and he answered that and that was taken as blasphemy and he was condemned to death. And it went up to the Supreme Court. There was huge 
international campaign for his life. All the major international organizations, including Rationalist International, International Humanist and Ethical Union, the, the Council for Secular Humanism, all major international groups raised international public opinion. There were demonstrations in front of Pakistan embassies worldwide, and Pakistan was forced to allow him to leave Pakistan and go to Switzerland. He lives in Zurich now. There was another person, a, a Muslim. I think she had some problem of mind or something like that. She was a Christian. She was accused of uh, insulting the Quran by tearing a page or something like that. She was accused and she was condemned to death. And finally, she was allowed to go to Canada. These all happened because of international pressure. But a law that exists wherein people can be simply executed if they have a different faith, imagine that. That is the key of Islamic intolerance. For example, if uh, other countries have blasphemy laws, well, four in 10 countries means 40% of the world nations still have blasphemy laws. 40% of the global countries have blasphemy laws. And this is a record in 2019. And 14 countries of that are in Europe. 18 are in the Middle East and North Africa. 17 in Asia Pacific, 18 in Sub-Saharan Africa and 12 in the Americas. So you can be punished for being an atheist by, for denouncing any faith in many of the countries. But interestingly, if you are Criticizing Islam in a fanatic Christian country, that's not taken as blasphemy. Only if you criticize Christianity, that's taken as blasphemy. If you criticize uh, another religion in a Muslim country, that's not taken as blasphemy. Only when you criticize Islam, that's taken as blasphemy. Isn't that interesting? I'll tell you one more example. There was one famous painter in India, Yamaf Hussein who was also known as the Picasso of India, one of the finest uh, painters of India. He has been, I mean, he was born in 1915 and died in 2011, I think. He was a very bold, vibrant, and his painting is, paintings are considered to be one of the finest with, with the great influence of the Bombay Progressive Arts Group and also the international movement. And uh, he has been, I mean, greatly influenced by the Cubist school of painting, and he was a brilliant, brilliant painter. Again, imagine, he was a Muslim by birth. Painting is a sin for Muslims. You can only have a calligraphy in Islam. You can have buildings pictures, but you cannot have humans pictures drawn in paintings or in any other form. But Emma Hussein did not believe in this traditional Islamic idea, and he went on painting, and he went on painting many things. And I mean, and he's paintings were very narrative and very powerful. And uh, so that was the time some of his paintings, for example, Voices, was auctioned for $2.5 million. That's the kind of value that his paintings were getting. I mean, even now, I mean, to have a painting of Picasso in your home, which means that you are a millionaire. Um, so the writing organizations in India, we are very unhappy when he has, yeah, that was uh, in something around 2005, 2006. The radical writing, right of the, the Hindu group, extreme forces, they turned against him because one of his small caricatures had a nude Saraswati. A picture, a drawing a, of Saraswati was there. And this Saraswati, if there is no specific body organs or anything mentioned, but that was a nude Saraswati. And he has also painted a lot of other Hindu mythological heroes. He has been drawing a lot of other things also, but somehow this small picture that he has drawn, the, the picture of nude Saraswati, was taken as a point to fight against him. His exhibitions were completely attacked rampant and I mean he was um, humiliated 
and there were slogans whenever he was going and there were cases filed against him i mean all around uh, different parts of india almost the same way like uh, cases were filed against me when i exp explained the uh, the dripping miracle of mumbai but uh, hussein was he felt his life was in danger that was by the hindu fanatic groups they could not tolerate that somebody draws a painting or or not even a painting a small picture of saraswati who is nude but if they have gone to the indian temples they could have seen if you know about the history of indian iconography they could simply see that many of the indian goddesses are presented in our temples as nude persons i have seen nude parvati in temples these are part of the faith itself during the tantric era lot of gods and goddesses were presented without their clothes and they feel it perfectly okay there are pictures and paintings in many temples where in the god krishna the young krishna climbing on a tree branch and stealing the, i mean after stealing the clothes of the women who were taking a bath and asking them to come out of water so that he could enjoy their nudity and then the their clothes okay that's a little uh, wicked boy in the, i mean presented uh, uh, as part of krishna's young life but i've seen a huge painting a mural in a temple in kerala etumano i say young boy i've gone and seen this i mean i still remember to such a beautiful erotic pictures a huge erotic painting with nude women many of them and young krishna enjoying their nudity that's inside a temple in 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 etumanur in kerala there are many many in tamil nadu i have seen nude parvatis in 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 temples these are part of the tradition nudity was never considered something so blasphemous or negative in indian tradition that's a semitic idea but somehow this nude saraswati when it came from a person with a muslim name though he was not a practicing muslim though he was painting against the ideas of islam in islam you cannot paint any human figures he was attacked by the fanatics the kind of talibanis from the hindu group attack him the same kind of intolerance that we have seen when the recent statement about mohammed came he had to flee from india he escaped india to save his life but ironically when this person who was a blasphemous person in the eyes of some radical right wing hindus was given asylum by a country namely qatar in the arabian uh, gulf qatar gave him asylum and gave him a citizenship they found it perfectly okay that uh, mf hussein has drawn a picture of uh, saraswati that is nude would they tolerate the same thing if somebody draws not a nude picture of muhammad but just a picture of muhammad or caught a sentence which was in bukhari in hadith that's narrating muhammad's life not even a painting just a narration a boat what is already written there most of the world media is so afraid to speak about that but what's there to be afraid about that it's written in their own book hadith very clearly mentioned that muhammad has married at the age of the aisha was only 6 years at that time and she was 9 when she started a sexual life with her but i have earlier also i've mentioned about this i don't really appreciate people this idea that uh, somebody could uh, draw a picture was not an issue for qatar in any case but they would not accept something that would be i mean if somebody speaks about something that was written in hadith and approved by almost all the muslim scholars i mean i can i mean very clear if anybody wants to listen what the controversial muslim scholar 
Sakir Naik has spoken about this. There are some scholars who would like to try to, to present it in a different way. They would not accept this hadith, but they would say that Muhammad has actually married much later. Maybe she was 18 or 19. They wanted to present it fitting to contemporary times. But most of the Muslim scholars, majority of them, vast majority of them have corrected these people. Even people like Sakir Naik or many of the Muslim scholars in India even corrected this position and they insisted that Muhammad married uh, uh, Aisha and when she was six years old, she started, they started a sexual life with her when she was nine years old. So what's wrong with it? If somebody says that shall be the law now and people should marry uh, at that younger age, that's a serious issue. In, in contemporary times, we don't consider that children of that age have any possibility to understand what sexuality and understand what's a family life and they are not mature enough to enter into marital life. But imagine uh, that was a practice that was existing in many parts of the world at those times. There are stories and stories of kings and uh, other leaders who marry at a very girls of very young age. When people are at 50 years or 60 years, they would marry somebody who is 10 years or 9 years. Those were the practices at those, those times. Also, child marriage was existing in India. Even now it exists, not though not officially in many parts of India. In uh, Rajasthan, in many parts of, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, northern India, still child marriage, marriage is really happening. It's a crime, but still... Young boys and girls, when they are five years or 10 years, parents make a marriage of them. Then they're separated. Later, they join together at, when they are allowed to be in an official marriage legally. Child marriage is an offense. It's a crime, but still secretly it happens. It's reported worldwide. But that has been the practice that existed earlier times. Gandhi married at a very young age. He was 13, I think, 13 or 13. And Kasturba was only 12 years when they married. Rajendra Prasad, married at the very Indian, India's first president, married at a very, very young age. So what? Many people have, that was, I mean, in four, till four or five generations back, this was a practice in many parts of the world. So if you take one example from history and glorifies it for some reason or insults, on that basis, I would say that that's not justice. If Muhammad is to be humiliated for his marriage with Aisha, I would not find that's not the way Muhammad has to be criticized. I would say that the criticism to what Muhammad said would go to one another point, which is more important, is advocacy of violence. Though Islam is presented as a religion of peace, if you take Quran per se within it, you have a lot of statements that can be presented to justify violence. But if you go to Old Testament also, you can see similar things that would justify violence. If you go to Bhagavad Gita, some people can easily justify it calling for war and violence. Krishna is calling for violence to a pacifist Arjuna. These all are religious texts. You see, people have been writing these kind of mythological structures much earlier. Or people who are practicing all these things earlier. But even the violence that is presented or presented as a, as a justifiable position, one could see as part of a war, part of a situation. It was responding to a, a, a situation of those times. During a war, when there are clashing groups around. One could interpret this text in a way to differentiate what's history and differentiate it from the values that we have arrived at this moment. If somebody advocates violence, getting inspiration from Quran, there should be religious leaders coming up and saying that, look, those who are written at those times in a certain situation, and we need not practice that. It should be seen in a different context, in a different time. I would say, I mean, I'm an atheist. I would say reject all these religions, reject all these absurdities. 
But I mean, religion is a reality and there are people who interpret religion. And I would say, I would suggest that there should be secular interpretation of these religions, secular reading of all these religions to make things peaceful. If you start practicing violence against people of uh, homosexual orientation, I mean, based on the stories in the Old Testament, Sodom and Gomorrah, that would be homophobia now. There are violence against people who are having premarital sexuality or prostitution in the Old Testament. Old Testament of Jews as well as in the Old Testament of Christians. But no Christian country practices that now. It's interpreted in a different way or it's seen as something of the past. So similarly, this kind of a change happened in these faiths because there was a reformation. There is a big transformation of the ideas of faith and there were questions coming within challenging the traditional faith and its formats. But eventually the Renaissance at one side and the Enlightenment on the other side transformed the whole mindset in the world and people studied to reject whatever is not acceptable in these religious texts, not acceptable to our times and rejected it. Still many of them followed those religions. Well, that's comparatively a better position. Hindus, look at Hindus. The kind of war mongering that you can see in many parts of the ancient texts, the kind of, I mean, in a way humorous, but absurd stories in Puranas, the kind of justification of caste system or Varna, by principle, that's all rejected and buried past and people are moving forward. And Islam needs such a major change. It needs a reformation. I would call for the right of people to reject the religion and come out to freedom and nobody should be able to stop them for that. Blasphemy laws are to be completely demolished. All blasphemy laws are violence and violation of human rights and human freedom. These countries that still have blasphemy laws should study that and understand that the world has changed. And when they're keeping the blasphemy laws, they are living in the medieval times. People have the right to criticize their political leaders. People have the right to criticize their elected leaders. No political authority is left without criticism and opposition. No political ideology is left without criticism and opposition. No authority is left without having challenges against their positions. That's the crux of democracy. Dissent, the right to dissent, right to have a different opinion, should be able to speak his difference of opinion without fear of consequences and fear of punishment. That's what democracy is. We all accept in matters of politics this principle, but when it comes to matters of faith, the very same principle is not respected properly. If you have the right to criticize your political authorities or any kind of political ideologies, you have equal authority to criticize your faith and criticize any kind of religion. You can criticize, you can reject, you can leave it, you can troll it, you can make fun of it. And that's the new world order in a way. From French Revolution, there is a new way of thinking that you have the right to criticize. You have the right to challenge. You have the right to reject any traditional faith. And most of the religions, remember, keep their faith only by closing the doors to refuse people to escape. If they open the door, if they say that, well, if you want to leave this faith, just leave, no problem, you have the freedom. There'll be an exodus outside this religion. In Iran, there was a survey that showed that more than 52% of the population wants to leave Iran and their, I mean, religion, if they were allowed. But none of these countries want to open the doors. None of these countries want to give the freedom to the people to think themselves. If they find something wrong in their faith, they have no right to speak out that. They're afraid. They want to keep their faith intact by 
using this thought to be lash upon them and using the laws to completely suppress them without which their religion would crumble down that's the fear it cannot stand on its own the fundamental fear that these people who try to defend faith by violence is that it has no right it has no capacity to stand by itself it cannot hold criticism they cannot answer the questions if they have the strength to answer any of these questions that people are raising they would not use violence to address them the moment they start using violence it simply means that they have they do not have the confidence to address criticism imagine a situation that somebody says that uh, mohammed has married at the age of 6 and started living with aisha at the age of 9 i am an atheist i would defend mohammed as follows i would say that the times if that was 1400 years back and that was not a big or very wrong practice at that time still if we criticize a person in the past who lived in the 7th century from what he has done based on the values of those times i am not there to criticize that criticize muhammad and his views on other thing especially focusing on the intolerance focusing on violence the war mongering those are the things that would and and stopping of the human rights and rejecting the rights of women putting back women into the back doors that's where one has to criticize muhammad not on his marriage but if somebody speaks about his marriage one need not be so afraid about it also well since that's a fact since that's already written in muslims uh, i mean hadiths and uh, the, uh, especially in bukhari it's written very clearly why should they feel offended about that why don't they simply say that that was the practice of those times the problem is something totally different what they consider is muhammad's life was the greatest examples for all the times in the future if you consider his personal life was an example for people for eternity then there is a problem we cannot accept such an idea before a person man or woman gets into the age to take one's own decision no they cannot enter into a marriage they cannot enter into a sexual life that's against the ideas that we have developed over the years and we know that that's not good that's the present day understanding that's the present day value system that's the present day value law uh, source we cannot treat a person with the present day laws i mean 1400 years back you can you cannot go back and use a law of our times to judge a person but if somebody says that they need not be so offended also well people speak things let them speak let politicians be criticized let religious leaders be criticized let messengers be criticized mohammed criticized all his previous faiths he criticized or he rejected all these idolaters around kaaba i mean who have been putting all those thing so if he could criticize other faiths why don't others criticize his faith that's normal that's the new world uh, approach and islam has to study that there is no point that uh, they can defend their faith by using violence against other people now coming to the irony of the present day situation qatar which did not find Emma Hussein's this beautiful caricature was blasphemy. The Hindu nationalists found it blasphemy. They attacked him, and Qatar provided him asylum. But somebody speaks something, but that is very, very true. That Muhammad married at the age of six, and he had relation with Aisha at the age of nine, which already written in their own text. They find it highly blasphemous. They want government of India to. apologies to them there is a double standard in the whole thing i would say both are correct if they have given asylum to imam hussein i would criticize the hindu nation who attack imam hussein i mean i would i would appreciate the position taken by qatar by giving an asylum to him but the moment they turn against nupur sharma the spokesperson of the ruling party in india when she makes a statement 
from an official text of the Muslims that claiming that that's blasphemy, and for that India has to apologize to Qatar, there is something serious, and that serious uh, problem is not based on any kind of justiciable idea. And, and the, that is based on the idea of intolerance, based on the further view that nobody has the right to criticize Islam, but all other religions can be criticized. I mean, they would appreciate, I mean, if others criticize other religions or make a caricature, a lot of painting, everything is fine. But I would say that what they have to understand is the same position stands everywhere. Everybody, every single person has the right to make one's own judgment, one's own reading, one's own evaluation, one's own understanding, and one's own way of critical thinking applied, and one's own right to leave the religion. These all are to be respected. Any civilized part of the world has to understand that human dignity stands on a strong foundation of human freedom. And human freedom essentially involves critic of religion, critic of political authority and free thinking. That's what is to be defended and justified and fought for. Thank you very much. And I think we can move on to the question answers round now. And whoever wants to ask a question can raise their hand through the hand raise tool icon. I would just access myself with Clubhouse as well. So whoever has a question, they can raise their hands. Currently, we have Kunjatu Chandrahasa with us. I would just request you to unmute yourself and proceed. Uh, my point is, uh, on this, the reaction from the Indian government is... Uh, to immediately suspend uh, Nupur Sharma and sack the other guy, that uh, Naveen Jindal. And uh, as a rationalist, what should be our views on this? Is the decision, because uh, as you said, uh, Nupur Sharma might not have uh, told something different. Then what should be, as a rationalist, our views on this? I just would like to clarify. Um, BJP as a party has the right to suspend anybody if they like. It's their position. But yeah. I would say that's quite unjustified in my view. Yeah. Any political party uh, expel somebody felt offended when one speaks a fact that should be taken I mean, I mean uh, very seriously and I would say that this approach was an overreaction to cool down and considering a political situation. Well, they may have one point. Nupur Sharma is the official spokesperson of BJP, the ruling party mm -hmm. of India. So yeah. as, a, as the official representative of the ruling party, can she speak like that if the party does not have a position like that? That can be a question that party can take. But if okay. she spoke as an individual, not as a spokesperson of the party, I mean, yeah. there is no, she should have her freedom and that's enshrined in the constitution of freedom to speak her views. But the party can decide if it's damaging for them and they can decide anything. But that's injustice in my view. She has said something very correct. Yeah. And yeah. reacting to somebody, another comment, which is also a comment against her faith. But I, yeah. I, I seriously believe that people have the right to criticize religion, have critical opinion, and the parties need not be too sensitive about that. In fact, uh, BJP should have defended uh, Indian constitution and the rights enshrined in Indian constitution of free thought and free freedom of expression, and defended this yeah. person instead of succumbing down to the, uh, the pressure that came first from these countries. But uh, in fact, what I'm feeling happy is that India has not agreed to apologize countries. So as a nation, India did not respond to that. They, they took a very clear position that they would not apologize, as I understand. But uh, this was an overreaction, perhaps uh, with considering the political situations. But yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's a wrong decision in my view. But uh, yeah. I'm not the person to speak about BJP. It's BJP yeah. that has to speak about their party. And yeah. uh, in my view, she did not do anything wrong. 
Yeah, that is what uh, we also feel like that. Yes. Yeah. But of course, the situation and the circumstances are different. Eh? But another thing, is it uh, probably not handled properly in the foreign policy or uh, this one? We suddenly immediately reacted to the these countries or there is a delay in the reacting uh, to the situation in front of these countries. I mean, I don't know whether these things... Uh, Apparently, uh, you know, there, there could be other practical political considerations that prompted the... Uh, the, the BJP to take a decision like that. They did not probably want to be presented themselves as an anti-Muslim party, which is a major accusation against them by its opponents. So yes. this is one major political consideration that BJP has. Also, one has to see a statement by the chief of RSS some days back. I've been watching Indian scene yes. very closely. I felt yes. very happy about this statement, one has to say. Absolutely. Though Absolutely. I would not appreciate the idea of Hindu nationhood that RSS would uh, race. The Hindu Rashtra is an idea I would not share. But yeah. this position that the RSS chief has made when somebody found a Shivalinga in the Gyanwati yeah. Mandir, yeah. the RSS chief took a position yeah. and to my surprise, he said, one should not dig up all the bones to find Shivalingas and that's not what we want. Yeah. Exactly. So that's a very positive stand, and that's yeah. to be appreciated. No matter, no matter who sees it, and somebody who sees it in the right direction, that's to be appreciated. I, I wholeheartedly appreciate that position. Yes, yes, absolutely correct. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we can move on to the next person. Uh, we have Kunjama with us. Uh, please unmute yourself and proceed. Good evening. Uh, thanks for this great talk. Uh, I don't know why people uh, criticize any religion because if you see the histories of the beginning of any religion, there is nothing to fight or dislike anybody on this basis, I think. And, uh, but I think there is, a, I believe, I think there is cosmic energy and it has a conscious, it's very conscious. Uh, this is the way <laughs> I feel. Am I right or wrong? Well, I mean, that's your, your belief. I mean, uh, you can certainly believe in anything. You can even believe in a flying saucer and flying spaghetti. I mean, there is no problem. Cosmic energy or flying spaghetti or anything you can believe. Okay, there is an issue. So we can move on to the next person from Zoom. Uh, so we have Unni Krishnan Raman from uh, Zoom. Please proceed with your question. Uh, Sanal, uh, thank you for uh, giving, getting the chance uh, to ask the question. Uh, my uh, three question, actually, uh, maybe it will go to uh, one subject. Here always assume is coming Islamophobia and uh, the criticism of today's subject. Very good subject. But my uh, curiosity question is, uh, can we uh, in the society can criticize Quran? Basically, as my understanding, Quran, no one can criticize. And uh, this is the final prosperous. Uh, Muhammad is the last person. Whatever the Quran, it is the final word. No one can uh, convert, as per my understanding, no one can convert in English or any other language. You have to read in Arabic and speak in Arabic. And your scholar should be from Arabic uh, accent. In ac and Arabic accent also different, different people. In, if you go for the Middle East, different people speak different way of Arabic. So you have to learn the Arabic and understand the Arabic and uh, understand the Quran is as per the Arabic format only. This is my first understanding. Is it true? Then only I can ask the next question. I, I, Thank you. I, I think we take one by one. That's easy to handle. As per many Muslim scholars, uh, Arabic is the language of the heaven. That was the language that Muhammad spoke. And I mean, this, where the faith came, I mean, the Arabic was the language. Therefore, it's properly understood according to them that everything is communicated in Arabic language. That Arabic is taught wherever Islam has reached, Arabic has been taught. And in ancient other religions, for example, in uh, other places where Islam has reached, the traditional languages were suppressed by Arabic language. Persian language was practically suppressed by, uh, I mean, uh, that, perhaps that's the only language that survived with the onslaught of Arabic. But Syriac languages suppressed, uh, or the, all other languages were suppressed. And wherever Islam reached, they taught their religion in Arabic. But all the same, 
Quran is translated into English and all the almost all the other Indian languages. For example, one of the most respected translation of Quran is Pital's translation, which is accepted by most of the Arab countries also, or Arab scholars also, closest to what is there in, in the Arabic text of Quran. And also, when uh, uh, in Libya, uh, they have been officially, or many countries have been officially printing a Quran in different languages and trying to circulate it also, because nobody would understand if it's only in Arabic, only those people who would understand the text will, will get it. So they would insist and promote Arabic. They will give their religious education to the converted or the faithful in Arabic language. Still, there is translation available. And translation is not forbidden in my understanding. I have copies of Quran in, uh, uh, in English. Pictal's edition I have. I have, even, I have even a Malayalam edition, which is my mother tongue. But can one criticize Quran? Nobody would like to get their religion criticized. Would Christians like Christianity criticized? No, they would not like it. Will any political leader uh, like if he's criticized? Will any political party like if they are criticized? There are cyber warriors for most of the political parties to attack those people who criticize their political views. They are so afraid. Criticism is something that scares people. They run away and attack those people. Instead of answering the questions, they would like to attack the, the critics. critics. Like Islam, many political parties also do the same thing. They don't want to sit down and answer the issues raised by its critics. Rather, they will humiliate, attack, arrest, or, or, or persecute the opponents. When it's an authoritarian government, it's more powerful and it can be more dangerous. Even in democracies, critics are not tolerated in many countries, including India, including many of our states in India. Uh, but all the same, religion tries to get a position like all dictators or all monarchs who would not like to hear any opposition. If anybody raises any, any opposition or question, they have nothing to explain. They have no strength to counter it. They don't have the guts to face it. They don't have to cool to respond to it. Rather, they will shout and scream and tell that our religion is in danger and it's blasphemy. Our sentiments are hurt. Therefore, the critic should be killed or attacked or government should take action. If governments don't take action, there'll be uh, fighting soldiers of the faith who would go and execute people like it happens in Pakistan. So every religion can be criticized. I remember 40 years back, my father was a renowned rationalist from India in Kerala. That was his mother tongue. He was a very famous writer. He wrote the first ever critic on Quran in modern India, which saw light. There was another person who wrote a book. Swami Sridhanand has written a book before independence, but he was killed before the first copy came out. My father, expecting all the consequences, he wrote a book, namely Quran, a critical study in Malayalam language. I've been the publisher of that. That was 40 years back. I was in my 20s. And uh, I still remember the kind of uh, public opinion that came against, but he took a very clear position that, come on, I mean, you shouldn't make sound. If you want to answer my book, do an answer. If you don't have any answer, if you're afraid, then you can make, shout make shoutings. But that was a good technique. Against this book came some nine or 10 books by Muslim scholars that opened up a dialogue. Lord, it helped a lot of people to come out of Islam and maybe a lot of people to defend their faith also because they started studying it and they started defending their position. Some people started reading Quran critically. So any kind of faith, any kind of idea, any kind of religion, any kind of political idea should face criticism. If it does not have the courage of conviction, then only they will take weapon and suppression against the critics and opponents. Thank you for giving the unmuting for the system. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next question uh, for the uh, geopolitics, uh, as you already said in the uh, last question answer also, uh, India uh, provide the apology. At the same time, I reading the uh, news media, India taking the steps for the Iran also. Uh, Iran uh, port they taken some it is a uh, why this uh, sudden happen this is my observation I, I don't have the evidence America uh, uh, moving some steps against India because of oil trade and everything 
so qatar and uh, gcc countries is uh, uh, india trade deficit or trade part i can say trade part is going down it may happen for the uh, their wealth tomorrow because india and china is the major buyers from the gcc country now india is moving to iran and uh, russia it will uh, and you last uh, i'm just adding the fuel uh, you already discussed last one so meeting or i don't know club house meeting the russian war is going to happen for the uh, trade uh, deficit for the commodities especially in the uh, wheat india stop the wheat and also these are the elements uh, tomorrow going to happen for the middle east like uh, qatar is a importing country uae is the importing country and saudi and uh, saudi maybe uh, they have some own resources and oman also there is uh, some resources but these two countries uh, uh, they, this is the consequences american game of play behind this uh, scenario is it true or no thank you well uh, the the uh, i've been a student of political science and that's my academic subject political science and international relations in that connection also i could try to see the whole situation if you see this as a political game the whole thing can have political connotations for example qatar was indian vice president was visiting qatar during this incident and uh, Qatar has asked India, requested India to provide wheat. India has excess wheat in its storage. The world is starving for wheat now because of the uh, Ukraine war. There is, Ukraine was one of the major producers and Russia was another major producer export and Ukraine exports are not happening now. Therefore, there is a shortage of wheat in the international market. And India has decided to stop export and it has buffer stock. So India has agreed to give Qatar enough wheat so that it can survive. Qatar does not have enough wheat. It has been asking India and India has agreed to give wheat to them. Then came this issue. So Qatar is the country that's asking India to apologize now, which India has not responded to. Now, interestingly, the other angle that many people would present would be uh, the, the political implications of this uh, new development. One major political implication could be economical for India. There are so many Indians working in the whole of the, the, the Gulf countries from in United, uh, I mean, uh, Arab Emirates, in Saudi Arabia, in Oman, all these countries, there are a lot of Indians in Qatar and all, there are a lot of Indians. If they decide to leave the Indians and take people from Pakistan and Bangladesh instead, that may not be very successful because Indian, the, you know, in fact, it's not a kindness to India that Indians are working there. If they are working there because they have a deficit of workers there, they don't have enough people to work. So there, there are experts going from these countries or other workers going from these countries because they don't have enough people to run their country. So these people are actually helping them by becoming migrants and doing things. So if who would be interested to leave all these people and uh, I mean, reach a situation that their services are underserved. That is in their interest also, not only in India's interest. Number two, as an exporter and importer, I mean, uh, of course, uh, there, is, there is a lot of trade between these countries and India, but it's not only one way trade. It's trade from India to these countries because they are not producing many food products and India is a major supplier and petroleum India is importing on the other side. There is a huge a uh, transaction going between these countries. If it goes down in their interest and if they make any blockage against India, what will happen? The major interest of India, Qatar is uh, giving India natural gas and the Saudi Arabia and other countries are suppliers of crude oil. India has huge storage of, I um, mean, the Gulf petroleum in India, huge storage. They're storing it in India also, number one. And it's not very easy for these countries to snap its relation with India and stop the huge market going somewhere, I mean, uh, somewhere else. India is one of the biggest buyers of petroleum. If India stop buying petroleum from the Gulf countries and go for other sources, that will be in whose interest? That will be the decline of oil prices and the decline of the value of oil. In fact, India has started that already. 20% uh, more import from Russia has already started. Because of the war with Ukraine, Russian 
petroleum is not very much welcome in many parts of Europe, but India has agreed to continue this and India has been you know, facing some kind of criticism from the Western world because of this. But when, if they make a blockage from the Arab countries, that would be a good justification for India to go for Russian oil and Russian natural gas. They are the big producers. And already there is a new agreement that India would be getting petroleum. All over the world, petroleum prices are going up. But India would be getting petroleum at a reduced price from Russia now. It has other political implications. I would feel the Russian attack on Ukraine is not justified, but from thinking from India's economic side, a shift from Gulf countries to Russia to obtain petroleum would not be in the interest of the Arabian countries and they would not jeopardize trade for their faith. Because at the end of the day, it's trade and money that decides the power of a country, not the faith. Oh, yes. No, thank you. I, I just want to... Uh... Uh, say that uh, I'm a Muslim. Uh, my parents are from India. I'm living in the United States. Uh, I'm a rationalist. Uh, I believe uh, in God and uh, I believe in the Quran. And I just want to say that I agree with uh, Sano that people should have the freedom to criticize religion and to criticize political authority. Uh, otherwise, we will have uh, tyranny and oppression. And I believe that uh, uh, the true Quranic reading invites uh, a, a, a genuine uh, criticism. And I just want to, uh, regarding this whole issue about uh, uh, prophet marriage, I just want to really quickly just mention that that is nowhere in the Quran. And it's in a it's in a something called hadith, which came centuries later. And the Quran, in no verse, says you should look at some books that will come hundreds of years later. And unfortunately, some Muslims uh, they become attached to the extra Quranic literature uh, uh, too much, and they don't realize that oral narrations uh, are very really subject subject to you know all types of fabrications and distortions. And I just want to mention that that, that that hadith collection is in, it's not accepted by all Muslims. For example, Shia Muslims don't even accept that book. And that uh, hadith has been, hadith <clears throat> means or narr narration. That narration has been uh, co contradicted by 15 other uh, uh, oral narrations that contradicted. However, those oral narrations they contradict it indirectly, uh, uh, but logically they they absolutely contradict it. So the chance that the prophet really had a marriage at that age, it's like one over ten to the fifteenth. So it's like whatever that number ends up being, like one over uh, like uh, ten trillion or whatever the ten to the fifteen is, because each of those fifteen um, uh, evidences. They're all independent to each other. They're all like they all refuted in a different way. So I just want to say that that rationally uh, uh, that that's not true. Uh, but I do agree that everyone has the right to express uh, criticism. Uh, however, I think that for uh, governmental officials, uh, it is inappropriate because then it can invite this uh, perception that the government is favoring one community over another and so on and so forth and that could lead to social uh disharmony so uh, thank you so much for letting me air some of these uh, uh some of these these parts and i wish peace and um happiness to all of you isan thank you very much for bringing that point i mean i'm very happy that you being a muslim being a person who still is in faith thinking about tolerance i mean that's what i suggested also. I'm not addressing people who are rationalists alone. There are people who are still in faith, but I would like them also come to the broad understanding that we have to live in peace. We have to coexist. We cannot kill each other. So that's the primary understanding that we all have, whether you're a Muslim or a Hindu or a Christian or a Muslim or atheist or secularist or whatever it is, we all have to live together. We have to understand the different perspectives of other people, different views of other people, their rights to speak whatever they think right. Without accepting and respecting this freedom of other people, we cannot have 
a peaceful coexistence is possible. In that context, I would say that, I mean, as you rightly agree, we all have the right to criticize any faith, any authorities, any kind of political leadership, any kind of religious text. That's having said that, I would also agree that uh, the hadiths were codified, I mean, hundreds of years after Muhammad actually lived. And there is a major school in Islam which would not sanction the hadiths. I fully agree that. But unfortunately, the majority of the Muslims in the world, if you take the number of people who accept Sahihul Bukhari and the major hadiths, and that's they are in the majority. And all these countries in Saudi Arabia or, or uh, I mean, or Qatar and all these countries, they would also accept the hadiths. And uh, they also consider that as part as that as the part of Islamic faith. A major section of Shias don't accept it. But that doesn't mean that people don't accept it. Well, for example, if uh, uh, they wanted to address this issue when Nupur Sharma raised this question, I would suggest, you know, that's a legal way of, or peaceful way of addressing it. They could say that, well, this is not accepted by all Muslims. There are, there are Muslim groups, they do not accept hadiths. This is not in Quran, but in the life of Muhammad as narrated in the, the hadiths only. So we don't accept that hadiths, either one can say. Or one can say that, well, that was the practice of those times. We need not think about that now. Because our, you know, even in our country, that's not possible. One can say there are many ways of addressing it. Answering is the civilized way of it. Addressing questions and addressing criticism is the civilized way. Not threatening, not violence, not attack. I fully appreciate the position that all Muslims would not agree that. Or all Muslims, I mean, I don't want that... Uh, Everybody think in my own line, but let people have different faith. Though I would wish that everybody come out of all these religions, which I think would be better for everybody, but still faith is a reality and people have the uh, freedom to believe in whatever they want and we all have to live peacefully. And the only way to live peacefully is seeing criticism, accepting criticism and trying to build up dialogue. Questions are to be answered, not to be, you know, not answered with the AK-47 machines or guns or or uh, or what you call swords. I mean, criticism can can be responded with the answers. That's the civilized way. That's what at least a major section of Muslim radicals have to understand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we can take Salim uh, from Zoom. The Muslims, of course, all other religious people are sensitive, but why Muslims are so sensitive? I have so many, so many friends. I, I, um, even though my name is Salim, I'm uh, actually I am a thief, and I don't believe in any religion or like that. Uh, and also by birth, I am not a Muslim. Okay, uh, I have so many Muslim friends, even Arab, Arabs, and others. And uh, I have I usually uh, criticize among even I am a Tatar Pandan. We had a one um, WhatsApp group. I have criticized about all the religions. But the first reaction came when I just commented Muslim uh, religion. Then all the seven or eight Muslim charter accounts immediately reacted. Even when I uh, went to Gulf or whenever, there, uh, when something say that is not right, they are coming out with very so sensitive language. What is the uh, reason? Can you tell me what, why they are reacting so? Like, Salim, I am uh, not, like, not just, just criticizing on religion, please. I, I, I understand. I understand. I understand also that you are not a rationalist. I mean, you are a, a, a Muslim, but still you cannot understand why they are so intolerant, right? No, I am not a Muslim. I am okay, a Muslim. Okay. Yeah, okay. 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 Whatever it is. But there is a, you know, a, a major section of the, the Muslim countries are having laws against blasphemy. That's one of the major problems that we are facing. Uh, per se, Muslims may not be that intolerant, but Muslim countries are very intolerant. There are 16 or 17 countries that give death penalty for criticizing Islam or uh, disrespecting their prophet, who is Muhammad. So why would they do that? Earlier, Christianity had similar laws. During medieval times, anybody who had a different faith, anybody who questioned the authority of 
God, as per their belief, they would be burnt in uh, stakes or they would be burnt alive or because blasphemy was considered a big sin and it was called heresy and heresy was punishable with death. But that is changed. The French Revolution, Europe transformed totally and everything changed in Europe. But such, that kind of a big enlightened movement that led to the French Revolution was absent in the Muslim countries. So what many people say is that there was, you know, st by stages, these changes came in Europe and in the Western world. The Reformation, then the Renaissance, the Enlightenment movement, then the French Revolution, and then the Rationalist movement, the Free Thought movement, that all has transformed Europe. Such a thing did not happen in India also. We have from the anti-priesthood movement was there, the anti-caste movement was there. People like Ambedkar came in India. Caste system was one of the major problems in India. There was corrections within the Indian structure. Even the Hindu faith, uh, people like Dayananda Saraswati challenged the, the foundations of caste system. And he, of course, he started defending Vedas, but he tried to modify Hinduism. There was Swami Vivekananda in India who rejected astrology and many other superstitions. I mean, they were perfect, but they were all trying to reform their religion or to deform what, what is emerging as Hinduism that was all going through corrections and modifications from within. Christianity went through the same process. Hinduism went through the same process. Buddhism went through the same process. Such a process did not happen in Islam. That's the problem. Islam did not start a major corrective measure from within. Reformers were not tolerated. They were suppressed. So this is something that is to happen now. There are two ways of handling it. One is people who are free to go out, should be, the people should be allowed to go without fear. Leaving Islam, I mean, should not be a punishable offense. When they become part of the world, I mean, part of the civilized world, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates are trying to transform themselves and change a lot of things. And they have to come into modern world. And this is one thing that they have to study, that we have to live as a peaceful world by developing peaceful coexistence. We should allow people to leave their faith if they want without fear of consequences. They should be allowed to criticize the faith, but if they feel their faith is correct, there should be Muslim scholars coming and defending their faith instead of arresting them and whipping them and beheading them. So this is what is lacking and there should be a call for this. From within Islam also, there should be a call for it by reformists, by people who want to change the situation. Because we cannot live in medieval times. Islam is forcing the, its faithful people to live in medieval times. Whereas this, this what happened in other religions did not happen there. And it has to happen. And things will change in the, in the world in where Islam is very, very predominant now. There also things will change. And world cannot go back. It has to go forward. I'm, I'm not a blind optimist, but we all have to strive for it. We have to change it. Because the freedom that the modern world has achieved is belonging to everyone. A section of the population more than 1.4 billion people in Islam cannot be denied the freedom that others enjoy. So there should be a movement within Islam, not only from atheists and rationalists, but also the faithful Muslims asking for the right to criticize, right to modernize, right to change. And many Muslim countries are already in that process and it should be accelerated. And also, I think, uh, shall I ask something more? Yeah, please, please. Uh, are the atheists afraid of uh, Muslims? Because uh, I have another form also, the Kerala Shivadi Sangam. They have never commented anything about this. I am not uh, another form, form uh, platform, but uh, I am saying that I have not uh, seen any. Uh, moreover, the blasphemy is still uh, valid in India. Why can't we oppose that or challenge in court or like that? Uh, I mean, there is a blasphemy law in India, of course. Challenging it in a court of law uh, can be possible only when a person is affected by this law. One can, can one go with a public interest case. There was one effort in 1960s, but that was a premature effort by not, an, I mean, apparently that was done deliberately not to make it a success. It was a very unprepared uh, case somebody has made. In fact, the blasphemy laws can be rejected by if you accept freedom of expression that is guaranteed in the 
in the fundamental rights, one can challenge the blasphemy laws, but one should be there to be victim. When the blasphemy cases were coming against me, I was thinking, well, this is an opportunity. I'm not going to fight this case on merits on blasphemy, but I would go to the Supreme Court of India in the constitutional bench and fight this case again after 1960s. We have a golden opportunity now to fight that case. Unfortunately, they never charged the case and it never came into being. They tried to corner me in other ways, I mean, but not through this case. Um, but in Kerala, there was there is no rationalist afraid of uh, seriously afraid of uh, Islam except those people who are trying to use Muslim population's interest or their political uh, orientation into votes or uh, their support base. For example, 40 years back, when, when my father has written the book, Quran, a critical study, it was such a strong criticism about, I mean, Quran. And it speaks a lot about uh, the whole faith structures in Islam, but originally quoting from uh, the Quran, and there was effort to ban the book. There was a lot of hue and cry against that book, but that book is still available online. I mean, you, anybody can buy the book, still we can uh, provide the book uh, by ebook. I mean, it's all available everywhere. So when this book was published, I still remember uh, my father, one of the, I mean, he was a former general secretary of Kerala, Yuktivadi Sankham, of course, I mean, he left that organization because of its uh, political lineage, I mean, especially towards uh, one political party. And uh, he was more focusing on the Indian Rationalist Association later. But uh, the then leader of the Kerala Yuktivadi Sankham was very unhappy about this book, I know, because he was also associated with the political party and he was also contesting in the local council. And he even went to inaugurate a madrasa. So they were such rationalists always. We call them pseudo-rationalists. Uh, my question is, in order days, marriage has been considered as a political. Like in Hinduism, um, uh, there's a caste system where the politics is maintained. Uh, so, and in also uh, in the marriage of Aisha and Prophet Muhammad, also there's a politics. Like uh, the daughter of a Khalifa, so, new world, how can we just, uh, is being an atheist be a marriage and a political? And a political? Well, I mean, I, I, I understand the question. I, I mean, if one sees the history of those periods, I mean, Abu Bakr's daughter, Abu Bakr was, a, in fact, the military, he was heading the military partially the military of Muhammad also. Abu Bakr's daughter, that was Aisha, and, and there could be a political angle in that marriage also. Well, I mean, that's how many of the political leaders would marry. Akbar has married um, many people from different faiths. Akbar, the Indian emperor, he married Jaipur's uh, king's sister. He married a Jew. He married a Christian. He married a Muslim also. He had four wives from four different religions. And he allowed them all to keep their faith. And keeping the, the Hindu wife, the Jaipur king's close relative, was a way of uh, establishing peace with these countries. And ancient kings and emperors have used marriage as a tool of political expansion. I fully understand your position. And that's one, one way of answering it also. But if somebody makes a criticism, one should not be angry. One can say that, I mean, well, I mean, marriages happen like that at that time, number one. Number two, this marriage has a political angle, and that's how one should be see, one should see it. That's the answer to it. Instead of answering it, that's a logical answer, who, if he wants to stand on the faith. But instead of answering, feeling offended, feeling your religious sentiments hurt, and asking countries to apologize and provoking violence is not the way. That's not the way of peaceful coexistence. That's what I'm suggesting. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Uh, one more, uh, I heard a, a speech of Epiji Abdul Kalam mm. in the UN where he said, uh, family is the foundation of a nation. So, you know, uh, as a rationalist, uh, as a thinker of a rationalist, uh, how can we uh, be a political in a marriage in, in this new, uh, new world? How can we be a, a political in a relationship? Uh, one can, <laughs> a, a relationship normally happens when people like each other. 
that's how i understand when two people find it interesting to be together then they become to, they come together and then uh, it can be a marriage it can be a relationship it can be anything that they want to but that is how it should be it should be beyond caste beyond religion beyond race beyond languages it's the love and desire and liking of people that gate all relationship that's the most valuable way of relationship also if any political ideology stands against it if any any racial idea stands against it if any religious idea stands against it and if caste stands stand against it we should be able to reject it and go for the call of our minds that's how human relation should be established the foundation of any successful relation is mutual desire mutual desire to be together that should be key no other consideration shall come in between it's no politics no religion no caste no race no language no age no physical disability is nothing it's just the liking of two people but apj abdul kalam speaking about the values of family i mean he had a family of course he had father and mother and all if family is considered as marriage well he did not marry by the way if he considers marriage as the foundation of a family and marriage is the foundation of a successful life uh, he should have opted for a marriage he did not opt for a marriage and he opted to be a single person that's what he was in his personal life i personally believe i have been in marriage but i personally believe that the marriage system is uh, facing a big transformation these days in the last few centuries it has been coming and the last few decades the system of marriage is going through a transformation or an evolution its forms are changing the rights of the individuals are more and more respected there are now earlier the marriage was a male dominated structure with a lot of misogyny and a commanding husband and a wife now it's two equal individuals and moreover people may not be insisting on a religious thought people are going out of religion and going for civil marriages sometimes people are living together without any marriage sometimes they decide to be together for some time and then going away from that so more and more autonomous individuals financially independent individuals emerge and the traditional marriage system is undergoing i don't think that it's totally changing but it's undergoing a big transformation with shift of focus and shift of authority it should be a political it should be irreligious it should be beyond caste beyond nation but liking and desire of people that's the key okay so uh, i already asked him this too but uh, i forget one more question it's a geopolitical question for the american question you already answered the uh, uh, that time uh, i feel uh, there is a one more uh, scenario in america uh, modi going for middle east and there is a direct uh, remittance is coming because bank is not uh, using the uh, interbank division that american dollar is not touching from uae to for example uae to uh, indian rupee or qatar is to indian rupee or uh, saudi is to indian rupee so the trade practice american dollar also not demanding the world market this is also one of the uh, scenario suddenly the, the, your father and a lot of people is criticized quran uh, and still uh, our club is lot of people is uh, criticizing why suddenly this spokesman is speak and this is uh, uh, breaking the uh, head of everyone that's why i am wondering uh, still i have uh, some geopolitical issue is going on with the uh, middle east and uh, uh, some area of american interest and russian interests or uh, now iran interest also this is the uh, trade uh, it's a trade war no uh, it is my uh, observation thank you you are absolutely right to nitishan trade money politics this influence most of these decisions it's not religion that decides none of these countries consider anything beyond their national interest at the end of the day it's a national interest that guides all policies so what happens now is very clear uh, us has been the basis for the dollar uh, dollar has been the basis for all petroleum trade all over the world that's why we call it petrodollar the basis of the value evaluated of uh, petroleum is dollar no matter you you buy from norway to to england 
uh, or, or Russia, from Russia to China, the international trade practices unitedly agreed that it shall be dollar the basis for all this transaction. Dollar is the, the basics of the value of petroleum is decided with dollars. That has improved the status of the dollar a lot. Dollar value has gone up and American economy got a huge boost because of the petrodollar. Now with the Russian-Ukrainian war, there's an embargo on Russia. Most of the European countries cannot buy petroleum directly from uh, Russia, but Russia has made a condition. If you want our petroleum, you have to buy it with you ruble. But the European countries cannot make direct buying from Russia because there is an embargo where the European Union is part of. So what is done is a kind of, kind of an eyewash practically. Every company that wants petroleum from Russia, Russia is a huge producer of petroleum. What they do is there's a ruble account, then a, a euro account. You put your money in the ruble account, uh, the, the euro account. You pay it in uh, euro. It's transformed into ruble and the payment is done. Uh, to their own account in ruble, and then it's transformed to Russia. It's a kind of a, a gimmick only, a practical way of handling it. Germany still is importing a lot of uh, petroleum from Russia. Hungary said they cannot stop it because they are dependent on that. Many countries have affected. Finland, for example, was getting, one company was getting 10% of its uh, uh, electricity from Russia, but uh, Russia has stopped it because uh, Finland has applied for membership in NATO. Now Finland is getting from Sweden that uh, uh, electricity. There's a lot of changes in trade interests, uh, which was triggered by the war. United States, of course, is interested that everything goes with the dollar. That's the, the, the dominant currency in the world. The most powerful currency in the world is still dollar, because most of these transactions are going on in dollar. So what should happen when Russia insists that it should be bought in ruble? The value of the importance of dollar will decline. You like the war or not? I don't like the war. I don't like this invasion of Russia very clearly. But all the same, I understand the whole thing. The mechanics is working in a very different way. India has a natural pressure to go to buy from Russia. When India go and buy from Russia, it will be in ruble. There is no international pressure. I mean, to, to buy ruble, that will stabilize ruble and India will have more and more petroleum. So this will be practically uh, a, a, an answer for the, the, the pragmatic reality based around the requirement of petroleum of a country. So these kind of interests seriously matter. United States has an interest. It has an interest to, uh, to dominate the whole petroleum scene. And it does not want Russia now to sell petroleum. Most of Europe was dependent on uh, uh, Russian petroleum. So now they have to, Norway is another country which has a huge storage of petroleum, which was not tapped properly. They don't have enough processing uh, situation, I mean, facilities there, which is activates very fast and very soon, Norway will be providing uh, a lot of petroleum for Europe. This is a changing scene of the petroleum uh, based politics and petroleum based economy. And as you rightly said, economics, and trade interest matter a lot in, in policies. It's trade that takes the wheel of politics running. International relations and all international connections move on trade. Trade is the, 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 the vehicle that takes the relations of country, between countries forward. That's where now the shift is coming, which is going to change a little bit the scene of uh, not only the petroleum, but also the global economic status. Uh, can I add on, uh, one more, one more thing? Uh, America never going to change uh, their one, two, three law. Am I right or not? Uh, this, uh, their foreign policy, if there is a ruling in the, which party or which uh, president is still in America, there is no changes in one, two, three law. Am I right or not, sir? Yeah, America considers it as the, the I mean, America first. That's the policy that Trump officially set, but Biden also follows the same thing. But all earlier presidents also followed the same thing. After the Second World War, we see a very powerful United States of America, which is, I mean, handling more than half of the global economy. And it's a huge, powerful nation. And its military is very powerful. Its arsenal power is very powerful. Its nuclear power is very powerful, but they have to 
the more power they have they have to be more responsible otherwise it can be catastrophic for the whole world so therefore one has to understand america's desire to be the leader of the world at one side but every country has to think of their economic interest and their own trade and their own national interest see india and china as emerging two major powers with a huge population and large size of the global economy would influence the global politics in the coming decades is very very clear and that will be i mean of course america would not like to happen it in that way they would like to keep their status quo so this will be i mean certainly i mean every every american government no matter whether it is trump or biden they have american interest in the primary four cents very clear uh, good evening uh, good evening sir sir hope you are great uh, the uh, the topic of the discussion why does islam fail to address criticism i think uh, this topic itself is uh, uh, quite contradictory to what general muslims the majority of the muslims think about that because we feel that as a muslim myself i feel that islam does does condone criticism and it doesn't shy away from replying to critics and uh, there is a fine there is a dividing line anyway between criticism and abuse abuse cannot be tolerated not not by any for if someone abuses someone so you wouldn't be happy with that someone abuses your mother or father it's not a proper way of doing things you can criticize you can criticize the point so you can you can you can have alternate point which you feel is better than the other person but abuse is uh, exactly what this uh, bjp spokesman nupur sharma has done and he, she has used a very derogatory word on our prophet it is not i as an indian muslim just not just cannot accept that one because there be there be a lot of uh, a lot of uh, what is that uh, mud slinging or derogatory words used earlier on but uh, this is a personal attack on prophet that is very hard to take it because uh, it's I, it is i'm not going deeply into what she said because i don't want to uh, get my hands also uh, stuck with mud but uh, the gulf nations the gcc countries had got great traditional relationship with india and as a malayali myself this coast of kerala has got trade relations with the gcc countries from coming the trade the motions coming for the spices the much valued spices not just the arabs from the gcc country they come from uh, china they come from europe because we have the black gold called uh, this pepper and we have all the variety of spices which they want to use uses in the cuisine over there and if you look at the trade i must have worked in the refineries in gulf countries in 2020 80 billion dollars it's not a small amount 80 billion dollars us dollars we pumped into the indian economy of because of the remittances of the people working in the gulf countries and the uh, in addition to that you have exports you have exports to countries like that you go to any supermarket in saudi arabia uae or any other places in the gcc countries you can find the chapuka from kerala the coconut from kerala the jackfruit from kerala and a variety of things indian products stacked up in uh, stationery books but this kind of irresponsible insensitive remarks would definitely harm this one and there are millions of people who are working in the gulf countries earning pumping money to the economy of kerala the kerala what we see over here is much different from what we the rest of india is because of the money that people toil over there i have worked in the gulf country i worked in the desert around 51 degrees it's so hard you had to be there to to feel it how you will be in the desert under the sun when when the temperatures rise up above 50 degrees and people go there in such harsh conditions and bring the money to there but this is going to spoil the relationship this is going to spoil the age old relationship we have with the gulf countries and um, see i uh, i'm as a muslim there are christians there are hindus working out there they don't refer, they don't differentiate like that they call all indians as hindi and they don't differentiate between religion or and uh, this kind of uh, <laughs> this kind of malice that's been spread about does not do good for this country and you said about this criticism i can tell you that you are <laughs> in europe right now 
And you, you know of, of one far-right politician, Dutch politician, uh, called Joram von Klarewin. I hope I'm pronouncing it correct. And he was a critic of Islam, and he was writing his book, an anti-Islamic book, and halfway through, through that one, while writing the book, he changed his mind and accepted Islam. He was a member of the PPV, PPV party, the Greek good welders is the, I think, is the founder of that one. It's a far right, extreme, racist, white supremacist party. And criticism, there are a lot of critics in Islam who had accepted, uh, who, who, uh, who were the opponents of Islam earlier on, who were accepted this one. And you can see one thing the Prophet's uncle did not accept Islam. There are a lot of uh, non Muslim communities who were there during the caliphate also. And I can tell you, one brief couple of incidents from the hadiths, we're talking about hadiths, because without the hadith, a person cannot be a practicing Muslim. Because in the Quran is written, how you need to pray. But how many times, in what way you got to pray, the hadith describes that one. And I will tell you, even uh, even after saying that one, the, the entire hadith cannot be considered as authentic. This has been clarified by clerics. It has been clarified those people who have deep knowledge into this religion, which I do not, I do not persist in that way. And uh, the prophet has very clearly said that if your neighbor, if your neighbor is uh, is going to sleep without food, with an empty, empty stomach, and if you fill up your belly with food, and you ask to God for forgiveness, <clears throat> your prayers will not be. Accepted. Um, I think you should come to this no, subject. Please. It's not a preaching I, of I, Islam here. Yeah. Yeah. Please, please. I, the Prophet did not say whether it's a Muslim or non-Muslim. It's a human being. And the Prophet, while this funeral procession of a Jew was going off, he stood up and paid respect to the person. And when the Sahabas, when the comrades of the Prophet said that, uh, Ya Rasulullah, why did you pay, pay respect to the person? There's a Jewish person who's going on. He said it's not a Jewish coffin is going on. It's, it's a human being. So this humanity transgressing religious faith is the hallmark of Islam, which I believe. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's all. Yeah, saying. thank you very much. Uh, it's a mainly you have been defending the faith of Islam and how great Prophet Muhammad was, which I do not share. That's a view that you have, but I have an equal right to say that that's just bullshit. And I very confidently say that that's just bullshit is my freedom to express. Will that be accepted in Saudi Arabia? If I'm a citizen of Saudi Arabia, can I stand up and say that, well, that's what Muhammad said, but that's just bullshit. Can I say it? I'll be beheaded. That's where freedom of expression is denied. Whatever freedom that Muhammad has offered as per the text, that freedom does not exist in 17 Muslim majority countries in this world. You said that Muhammad's own close relatives were non-believers. But if you are a Muslim and leave the faith, you are an apostate. And apostasy is punished by death in 17 Muslim majority countries in the world, including Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Indonesia, a lot of countries. I mean, in Pakistan, it's punishable by death. In Iraq, it's punishable by death. In Syria, it's punishable by death. This kind of a great tolerance that is attributed to Muhammad's time, anyway, it does not exist in the contemporary reality of Islam in power. That is the issue. What Muhammad said at that time is not what is our reality. Our reality is how Islam is now. So, I mean, why, if Muhammad has tolerated non-faith, and even apostasy, if as per your view, but there are quotes from uh, the whole faithful says that if you are an apostate, if you are a faithful person and leave Islam, you will be punished. That is lack of freedom. The doors are not open, it's closed and you're asked to remain inside. That's the, you know, the, the kind of stopping of people to have their own conscience. Even in Muslim countries, it's not there. Well, of course, there is heat in Saudi Arabia, Allah has not made that a I mean, very comfortable climate there. I mean, as per Islamic faith, I mean, these people should have gotten a, a, a good weather. Unfortunately, I mean, it's a very hot country. You have been worrying about the hot, uh, I mean, climate there. But that's not the issue now. Whether you, it is very hot for you to live there or not, it's not the question. The question is very simple. Whether we have the freedom to criticize the faith. And that freedom 
should be available to every single individual who lives anywhere in the world unfortunately that's not available in the contemporary muslim majority countries but not only in muslim majority countries in many christian countries in latin america also the same kind of problem is there if you are blasphemous you will be punished but if you ask the question if you can criticize the faith and will you be feel offended no if you feel offended you are not civilized that's how the modern world view is saying freedom of expression of everybody is to be respected the moment when you say that allah is the only god no other god is a god isn't that offending to other people if idolatry is denounced isn't that offending to the people who are idolaters i mean if one faith is great and all other faiths are bad if you believe in that isn't that i mean offending other people if you feel offended by others faith or others position there is a problem you can keep your faith nobody is forcing you to change your faith i am an atheist i don't say that you should leave islam and come to atheism if you come to atheism i would be happy but if you remain in islam also i am happy because i am not bothered about that i am bothered about the freedom of choice of people to choose whatever they want and that should be allowed in all countries if it's not allowed in india i am against that if it's not allowed in saudi arabia i am against that if it's not allowed in 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 uh, some other country also i am against that the question is no matter what religion you are in you should have the freedom to choose what you want opt out if you want i fully agree that uh, uh, many muslims felt offended when it was talked on a television but do you believe in hadiths there are muslims as a major section of muslims who don't believe in hadiths but they are a major part of uh, the, the the faith but the shia muslims mainly they don't believe in the hadiths but majority of the muslims believe in the hadith there are many versions but uh, uh, sahih al bukhari is something that like most of the muslims are accepting and what did nupur sharma say she said muhammad has married aisha when she was 6 years old and he started sexual relation with her when she was 9 years old that's all what she said nothing more nothing less that is a statement from hadith that is accepted by majority of the muslim majority countries in the world sahih al bukhari the 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 authentic uh, per many of these people i um, mean i don't think seriously that is authentic because that was written actually a hundred years some hundred years after muhammad period but this is what is accepted as the life of muhammad by majority of the muslim countries including pakistan including saudi arabia including qatar including united arab emirates they all accept sahih al bukhari they all accept hadiths if they accept hadiths it's a statement in hadiths it's written there that muhammad has married aisha when she was 6 years old and started marital relation when she was 9 years old why should you feel offended when it is actually written in hadiths i would say that you can dismiss it i don't consider it as an issue at this time i mean 14 i mean 1600 years 1700 years back what people have done is not affecting us because they had their own values at those times our values are guided by modern value system we are all governed by the laws in our countries in india if you are in a sexual relation if you are under 18 years it's a punishable act but gandhi has married when she was 13 years old that was not a law at that time so i don't want to criticize mohammed for what he has done on the basis of the value system etc at that time that's not my criticism but if if somebody says that that is how it is and that is how it is written in sahih al bukhari in in hadiths why should one feel offended about that what can laugh about it and say that come on that was the value system of those times we are not practicing majority of the muslims are not practicing and uh, the, the guy who was standing on the other side of the debate could have said that come on that was on those times i do not practice it the majority of the muslims do not practice they practice the law i mean that's the answer that's where you have to answer you should not feel harassed and you are not at the receiving end you are not a persecuted people the persecution mania that muslims are forced into now is the dangerous thing that makes them feeling vulnerable anything that is told they feel vulnerable there is no need to feel vulnerable every religion is criticized all around the world how much criticism is there around christianity what all trolls are all around how much criticism is there about uh, 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 i mean hindu religion 
I can tell my own example, my publishing company, I mean, which I started after training from the diplomatic career. I mean, I started a publishing company. And one of the first books that we published was uh, my father's book, Christ and Krishna Never Lived. It argues that hist- uh, questions the hist- historicity of Jesus Christ. A lot of people feel very serious about that, especially the Pentecostals are very, very active about that. The Catholic Church published a 900 pages reply for that, but that's all dialogue replying to that. But when we published a book on Quran, then came a book, Bhagavad Gita, a critical study. Well, it accuses Bhagavad Gita of warmongering. I've written a book about Vedas, very critical about Vedas. But that all were taken lightly by people. The moment a book came about Quran, less critic than the book on Bhagavad Gita or uh, Vedas, there was huge hue and cry. There were effigies of my father burnt in many parts of Malapuram and all in Kerala. And uh, I mean, he was under the real threat of his life at that time. Of course, I mean, he challenged people to answer it. That's how one should do it. If, if for example, if you feel that Muhammad actually did not marry at the age of six and this nine, then also you can say that I don't believe in these hadiths. You can say that. That's the way to answer. One way to answer. The other way to answer is that's a value system of those times. I don't really enjoy that kind of criticism, to be honest. I would not criticize Islam because Muhammad married somebody at some age. Rajendra Prasad, first president of India, married. Uh, the girl was only 12 years old. So what? That was the value system at that time. That's changed now. And no, nobody should be criticized in history, I mean, who lived on the basis of the value system of those times. You cannot criticize somebody because he, he believed in some kind of absurdity in, in the second century or third century. And coming to the trade, the long relation between India, especially the Malabar coast and the Arab world, did not start with Islam, by the way. The Arabs existed before Islam came also. Arabs were the, the custodians of the trade before Islam came. That is why Islam could come to Kerala and Lakshadweep, because they transformed Islam, and that transformation came to the Arabs uh, who were coming here also. Before Islam came, the, in the fourth century, we had already people coming to Kerala and settling down from the Arab countries. Many of them were Christians. It was not in the first century, but fourth century, they were Arab migration to Kerala. From Armenia, they were migration from Kerala to Kerala. Then later also they were coming. And when Islam came, also people were coming. So the Arabs were, were having the monopoly of the trade, the most powerful uh, the product of wealth of those times, the black pepper. That was owned by the market was under uh, it was a monopoly of the Arabs at the time. That's why the, it's it's Arabian Sea was under their custody before even Muhammad's time. Arabs were the, the 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 people who had the monopoly of the trade. It changed only when Vasco da Gama came in the beginning of the uh, I mean 16th century. In, in, in 1498 he came. By 1500 beginning this change the shift of the, or, I mean, the, the pepper trade. Because the Amsterdam market was flooded with the, I mean, the traders coming from the Arab land. Who earned the wealth? When Arabs, when it was purchased at a low price here, and with several hands moved, and when it finally reached the market in Amsterdam, who benefited from that? Who got, got the wealth? Of course, the Indian kings got the wealth. That was all in gold. But the Arabian economy, was based on the trade from India. Trade is a benefiting thing for both the parties, not for one party. Arabs also benefited because that's why they came all the way to buy the pepper and took it to Amsterdam and made huge profit out of it. Well, the Kerala coast also got profit, but normally the, the producers get less money and the traders get the higher part of the money. That's there everywhere. And the beneficiary was the Arabs, then later the beneficiary was the Portuguese, then the Dutch, then the French, and then the British. All these people were traders. They had an economic interest. That's why they came, not because of the love for the Malabar coast. The trade relations was, it's a give and take. You give money and you get a product, which we sell, and you gain from the selling of it. That's what is trade. It's a trade relation. And with trade, come cultural relationship, religious relationship, other relationship. Trade is the, the forerunner of everything. So there is nothing very special about that. But if 
somebody makes a comment from Hadith, and if a nation wants to feel offended, one has to also understand that India has 1.4 billion people, and it imports 84% of its crude, uh, I mean, requirements from other countries. And uh, the, the third largest oil consumer and importer in the world is India. It's not, uh, it's not a charity that uh, Saudi Arabia or Qatar gives to India. We give money in dollars. India gives money. And the, the third largest consumer of oil, if it decides not to buy from them, but from Russia, who will suffer? The, the oil sellers will suffer. If the buyer decides, if India is pushed to a corner, naturally, already India has made a new deal with Russia, and India is going to get 20% less the price than the previous days. And that is going to say, why, why is the petrol price is double in Europe? For example, if I fill my car, I have to pay normally, I mean, 100 I mean, euros. But now if I fill, it will be 200 euros. It's almost doubled. But in India, the petrol prices are not going to be affected now because India is getting new petrol from Russia, which has huge uh, storage of petrol and natural gases. So the seller, is there is other traders available in the market. So naturally, and Russia is also in a vulnerable situation that their market is under decline because of the war and the embargo. So who would be, it's not charity, we are giving money. We are, they are not giving any kind of credit or anything. We are giving money straight away. And one third, the, the biggest, the third largest buyer, if it decides not to buy from Arabia, but from Russia, that will be the beginning of the collapse of the economy of the Arabian countries. So I think they would not do such foolish things because they are interested in their trade. Every country is interested in their national interest and national economy. And that is why, I mean, they made some lip service and gone away with that. Qatar has also, they also need India's support. When Indian vice president was there recently, they requested for wheat. They don't have enough wheat to feed their people. India has generously agreed to give wheat. Even if you have money, you won't get wheat now in the world market because the major suppliers were Russia and Ukraine. India is also, India has huge storage of wheat. You cannot eat your petrol. You need wheat, you need grains. And if India generously gave wheat to uh, declare, I mean, that we would give enough wheat to uh, Qatar, they should not come and make unnecessary sounds on some comments that is made by one political leader and that party has taken action on that. And even in my view, that is also inappropriate because everyone has the right to speak about whatever they feel correct. If it's wrong, one can challenge it. But of course, a party has its own compulsions and I'm not a person to judge about BJP's position. But uh, in my view, if she did not represent BJP at that time as an individual, if she was speaking, she has full right to speak about that. I mean, you can see Quran, a critical study written by my father 40 years back. It has a chapter about Muhammad's marriage. It's not accusing him, but telling the facts, quoting hadiths. It's ground there. If you accept hadiths, you have to accept the story also. Otherwise, you have to reject a major part of your faith that is Muhammad's life as a model for the future world. Thank you. I have a point. Please, please, please. Yeah, yeah. You said that uh, I suppose you were whitewashing the thing because um, uh, this lady has uh, did not just quote the hadith. She has used a derogatory word, which I don't want to repeat it over here. And I don't want to, uh, uh, because it is it's just abusing ourselves. And uh, this word is not required in in, uh, in quoting the hadith. This word was particularly derogatory word was not required. Okay, I will leave it again. I would like to correct that point. I have seen the tweet and article of Nubur Sharma after this whole incident. She quoted exactly with the video clip what she said. It clearly quotes hadith as Mo about Muhammad's marriage. Nothing more, nothing less. What Pakistan is trying to propagate by quoting and misquoting what they want because they have a political necessity to isolate India. It's not what we should follow, but the ground reality, which is still available on the net, what she spoke. You search Nubur Sharma's uh, 
controversial statement, it's available on the net. It's not removed even. YouTube, you get it and see whether she was quoting hadiths or saying something else. But I see a lot of Pakistani media speaking and misquoting her and because they have an interest in the whole thing. That's an interest of a geopolitical competition bet between India and Pakistan. And that has nothing to do with reality. Well, I don't think that uh, Indian Muslims can stand on their own feet. They don't require help from across the border. Because there are a lot of people, yeah. Indian Muslims, who fought for the Indian army against this one. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree. I mean, so why don't they answer it instead of getting hurt? If somebody says something, their wounds are, I mean, bleeding very fast because they don't have any confidence. They don't have any guts to face criticism. They don't have a strength to address peacefully a, a criticism. They feel they feel vulnerable. They feel that they're attacked. They are feeling like they are possessed by a lot of critics and they are running away from reality. They, they have to sit cool like all other religions and all people of all other religions face criticism and answer it. Muslims also, not Muslims, majority of the Muslims don't feel, only the radical and fanatic people feel about it. And they should study the language of tolerance, the language of answering, the language of dialogue, the language of answering critical questions. So, so can, you, can you remain cool when someone abuses your mother? I would say that, oh, you are crazy. And I would laugh because I'm not crazy. I don't feel attacked. I'm not vulnerable. You may feel, you may take a knife and stab him. I would not do it. That's the difference between you and me. You are a Muslim. I'm not a Muslim. A Muslim would feel intolerant to everything coming against him. If you abuse my mother, I would consider you as a weak person because you, you, you feel happy by abusing somebody's mother. And I would laugh at you. And I will say that you are simply crazy. I can laugh at it. But you, if I abuse your mother, you feel that you have to take a knife and come to me because you are trained under Islam. I'm not trained under Islam. That's a difference. It's a pretty long session, very interesting, good questions. And I, some, feel some, some of our friends felt offended, but don't take anything on the offense. I believe in peaceful coexistence, peaceful exchange of ideas and dialogue. It's in that spirit I'm speaking. And let's all live peacefully. Let's all peace live happily. Let's not fight each other. If there is criticism, let's try to answer it, address it, face it. Don't feel vulnerable. Don't be afraid. Have the courage to defend your faith if you believe in it. If you don't have the faith, if you don't have the courage to defend your faith, then you can make sounds, but that will make you look very weak. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.